सर ये तो होंगे हाँ हाँ सर लैन है पूरा सर ना ओके सर यू कैन स्टार्ट नाउ हाँ right good evening on behalf of elkem eurocare i ankit shah extend a warm welcome to our expert faculties and the august audience uh, who are urologists across the country who are watching us live through online and as well as physically uh, and saturday school in urology today is our 11th saturday school in urology uh, we have close to 25 live centers across the country uh, which are lucknow hyderabad chennai bangalore vizag mysore cochin warangal jaipur rohtak delhi calcutta guwahati patna siliguri bhubaneswar durgapur jabalpur pune nagpur rajkot and navi mumbai so these are close to 25 live centers where uh, esteemed urologists are uh, watching us live uh, and this uh, this uh, you know enriching discussion which is going to happen uh, with Uh, our leading experts so uh, just a brief saturday school in urology was started way back in 2019 under the aegis of then president of urological society of india dr madhusudan agarwal uh, and who gave us the wings and you know initiated this platform we remain indebted to sir uh, ssu is probably is uh, very scientific and academically uh, platform there entire in uh, intention is for scientific dissemination of best practices knowledge techniques challenges and many unique things which are evolving in the field of urology so in the past we have had honor of uh, you know highly uh, revered experts uh, starting from dr madhusudan agarwal dr mahesh desai dr sabnes dr kaushik shah we also then had dr shivaji basu and his entire uh, multi specialty group of fortis uh dr lakshman prabhu dr apul goel and dr rajesh taneja this was when we actually collaborated with uh usi in the year 2020 and then we also had uh, dr george ibrahim dr rajesh kukreja sir and dr sanjay kulkarni uh before this year and this year we also had uh, our last saturday school was on 18 june 2022 which was uh, chaired by dr anand shivraman along with uh, dr tirumalai ganeshan dr raghunath from bangalore and dr nitesh jain this was so in fact we have discussed very there are a lot of topics which has been covered under saturday school in urology right from bph to renal calculi to renal carcinoma to nmi bc bladder cancer pain uh, laparoscopic pyeloplasty to just urethra and to the last one which was localized prostate cancer uh, you can watch all these uh, previous Uh, saturday school on lkmurocare.com these are all archived in fact today's saturday school will also be archived for future reference and usage today we are happy uh, privileged and proud to have amongst us uh, the leading experts from across the country uh, professor dr divakar dalela sir from lucknow and professor dr surya prakash sir from hyderabad in fact they will be discussing on two fantastic topics obstructing void therapy and structure urethra substitution urethroplasty the best part today is that we have two sun gods amongst us you know dr divakar dalela so dr divakar divakar also means sun and we have dr surya prakash so sir also means sun so uh, you know it's it's a wonderful uh, occasion and uh, i request dr surya prakash sir to introduce dr dalela right thank you so much hello uh, good evening everybody uh, at the outset i would like to uh, congratulate the alkem uruk division for bringing out such uh, wonderful academic uh, programs for the benefit of all urologists across the, our country uh, i'm very happy to be part of this program and uh, uh, my uh, along with me today is uh, uh, esteemed faculty uh, dr divakar dalila i think uh, all uh, urologists across the country and across the globe and knows dr divakar dalila he doesn't need any introduction because he has been very active in academics to ask any postgraduate 
He said, no, yes, I have seen such videos on YouTube. So he's so famous. But it's my customary duty to introduce Dr. Divakar Dalila to all of you. Uh, he's a very renowned urologist from Lucknow. He's got more than 20 years experience in these uh, in the fields of urology, urology and endoscopy. He has been associated with uh, uh, King George Medical College as a resident professor and head of the Department of Urology. Uh, he's the innovator of 19 operating techniques, five urological instruments, and one urological disease. He has authored 32 patient education books. They are very famous in, in local languages and in Hindi. 24 pamphlets and 142 in index research papers. It's a huge number. And he has got many videos on YouTube. He's, a, he's been a recipient of 20 gold medals and six silver medals and three original innovation awards. So I present to all of you, Dr. Zivakar Lalila, Dalila sir, uh, to present this topic. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hello. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Surprakash, for a lovely introduction. And uh, at the outset, I'd like to express my gratitude to Alkem Eurocare for taking such wonderful initiatives to educate urologists and uh, postgraduates across the country. So in, in continuation of this program, School of Urology, I'm here standing before you this evening to speak to you on a very common clinical urological problem faced by everybody. Uh, before I start talking, let me specify that this topic is for postgraduates and also for younger urologists who just began their practice. And uh, uh, some of the content I have already put on my YouTube, say about 30% of what I'm talking this evening, and then rest of it is new. So the topic I've chosen, chosen is, I chose is uh, when somebody undergoes transduital resection. The patient, as well as the doctor, expects that he start passing urine very nicely and it will be all gaga about the outcome. But uh, as is true in surgery and science, it is not good, it is not the best all the time. The patients often have some degree of symptoms after the transvertical resection. How do we manage that situation? I am talking in this presentation only of the voiding symptoms. When patients after TURP have persistent obstructive problems, right? So the, the fundamental is fundamental to make a diagnosis of what is going wrong. Why has the patient having obstructive low urinary symptom when he has already undergone transvertical resection prostate? The key thing is a time frame. Time frame, the scenario one is when you remove the catheter after TURP and patient does not void, right? That's scenario one. So I'll have one 10 minutes talk on scenario one when patient does not void at all after transvertical section. The scenario two, the second part of my talk will be scenario two, when patient voids, but his stream is not satisfactory. Patient is not happy. He says, I'm having still obstruction in my stream. My stream is not good. That is scenario two. And this is, when the catheter is removed immediately after transvertical resection, right? So this is scenario one, scenario two. The scenario third is when patient goes home very happy after catheter removal, he's passing urine. And then he comes back after four weeks, six weeks that I had developed obstructive low urinary symptoms all over again. And this time they look to me more severe, more serious. What has happened to me? So that's scenario one, four to six weeks after TURP. And in this scenario, I'll be talking to you about diagnosis making of the problems. How do you treat so that the patient confidence in you is restored, right? So this is how all about is my talk is. I'll play the video, which will go on for some time continuously. I expect my audience to note down their questions, whatever they have in their mind and post them in the chat box. And in the interest of time, we'll take all the questions in the end of my talk. So uh, here I go uh, with my first part. So in the first talk, I shall be talking to you about that when after a TURP, the urethral catheter is removed and patient fails to void completely. Actually, after the catheter removal, 
following transuterine section of prostate, you can have two situations. One situation is a failed voiding trial, where patient is totally enabled to void. In a second situation is when patient is able to void, but he has having obstructive low urinary tract symptom. So I am talking of the first category, the failed body trial, right? Retention urine. Now, in this situation of failed body trial, how do you handle this frustrating situation for you and also for the patient? Now, first of all, you should ask yourself a question. Have you done a satisfactory transuterine resection of the prostate? And if the answer to is yes, that I have done a satisfactory transuterine section, then the reasons for a failed warning trial may be some kind of edema, which is persisting in the residual prostate cavity, or in some patients, lack of epithelization of the prostatic cavity. So one of these two or both of these reasons may be operational in your patient. And they are often cited as reason for failed body trial. In this scenario, we usually recatheterize the patient. And for a period of three to six days, the patient remains on catheter. And once the catheter is removed, the second body trial is mostly successful. How has this happened? What has taken place in three to six days that patient has been now able to avoid? Let me first elaborate to you about this persisting edema of the prostate cavity. What are the reasons for this edema in the prostate cavity? The one reason is that whatever peripheral prostatic tissue is left in the fossa, it has some degree of uh, prostatitis, active prostatitis. And another reason is that the operator has used excessive cautery uh, around the prostatic capsule or residual prostate tissue to attain hemostasis. The reason for using excessive cautery may be so many. The patient was having very vascular prostate gland or you were doing transfer resection on the very next day of acute urinary retention. So all the patient is on, you know, anticoagulant therapy, some something because which forces you to do excessive cautery. So if you have either of these reasons, the prostate tissue will get edematous. And when you remove the catheter in three days time after TURP, the edema might not have gone. Say for instance, this is how the prostate looks. And you have left behind a cavity here. And in the peripheral prostate, you have some degree of reactive prostatitis or you have created zones of focal necrosis at multiple places following the cautery. The second situation is lack of epithelization in prostatic cavity. Now, let me explain what I mean by this and why does this happen. If this is the uh, prostate which you are going to reset and when you do a transuterine resection, you leave behind a uniformly smooth fossa cavity. And if that is the situation, the epithelization will start from the bladder neck side and also from the urethral side. From both sides, the epithelium grows and the fossa gets outlined by a normal epithelium in three to five days. And once you remove the catheter, because it's a smoothly lined fossa, patient will void nicely. But if you leave behind a bumpy surface in the prostate cavity, maybe you resected small small bites or you have created too much of cotton necrosis areas. So this will, this is uneven fossa and because of ongoing necrosis and inflammation in the bed, you have delayed epithelization. Because of delayed epithelization, urine keeps exacerbating into the prostate tissue. So it's edematous prostate. Suppose in a case of large prostate, you resected the fossa like that but some people like to be meticulous and then they resect prostate completely and they create a fossa like this. In this kind of fossa, if you remove the catheter after three days or four days, 
the epithelialization has taken place only in the upper part of the fossa. The apical area is not well epithelialized. And I'd like you to have attention on the apical tissue, which looks like a flap. The moment patient tries to avoid, it falls like that, like a posterior valve. So a bit of residual mucosal flap, bit of residual apical tissue will fall like a posterior valve and will obstruct the outlet and patient will develop urinary retention. In this patient, if you had waited three days more, then the fossa will collapse and epithelialization will go on and will cover these apical flanges which were falling like posterior valve. Now once the epithelialization is complete and now you allow the patient to avoid, he will pass urine well. So my feeling is that if you have these three kinds of prostatic cavities, A, smooth fossa, B, uneven fossa, C, a large fossa, the duration of epithelialization in them will be different. And therefore, the time for avoiding trial after TURP should change. At least in large prostate gland. By large, I mean more than 80 cc of the prostate gland. Removing catheter on second day, third day may be fought by the danger of failed avoiding trial. If you give them sufficient time, five days, six days, they are fine. The second situation may be that when you ask yourself, in the beginning, have I done a satisfactory TURP and you know that for some accidental situation, some bleeding, or sinus, or some anesthetic problem, you left behind a residual prostate. If you left behind a residual prostate, you must tell the patient in post period that the prostate is left behind because this reason you may not avoid in post period. I will see what to do. So if this is the normal two lobes of the prostate gland. And when you've done, when you've done a resection, dominant part of your resection remain confined to towards the bladder neck and you leave behind apical tissue. Now this apical tissue is free to fall because it's no more attached to the bladder neck. The moment patient will start widening, these apical tissue will fall in front of the urinary stream and will block the outlet and patient will develop urinary retention. Another situation may be you left behind sufficient tissue in both lateral lobes. And when patient starts widening in the initial part, the lobes are lying in the passage. Or a situation like this, only one lobe was resected and you had a bleeding problem, so you had to abandon the procedure. So if you have these kind of variations in the anatomy of the residual prostate, patient will obviously not void. You will confirm this by digital electro examination or an ultrasound or a truss. You will know the residual prostate and this patient for sure will require a repeat transfer the resection. I am talking to you of a slightly different scenario where after the catheter removal, patient started voiding urine, but he continues to have obstructive low urinary symptoms and he is not very happy about the outcome. So this situation is called as persistent obstructive low unit tract symptoms after a transurethral section of the prostate. Why this happens is important to understand. One group of factors can be bladder related where the dominant reason is under activity of the detrusor muscle, a weak detrusor muscle. The second reason is related to prostate, where either there is some degree of residual prostate or the patient has bled in the prostatic fossa and there are blood clots in the prostatic fossa as well as in the lumen of urinary bladder, which are obstructing. So you can have either a bladder related reason for persistent slow stream or you can have a prostate related reason. In some patients, you have both. So management becomes a little more tricky. But for the sake of understanding, let us study them separately. Talking first about the underactive detrusor. 
how will you diagnose this problem in this kind of situation where patient is having uh, unsatisfactory sleep and he has other obstructive symptoms also. So how will you diagnose this problem here? And secondly, how will you treat this problem? First of all, let me tell you that in which group of patients you should suspect underactive detrusor. This I mean uh, in a preoperative situation. All experienced resectionists can pick up that this patient will not void well after transvital resection. And there are two categories of patients here. One category is the one who has been living with a large post void transitory urinary volume, something more than 250 cc. If his BVRU is this much, of course, he is in a state of decompensated bladder of obstruction and his detrusor muscle is not having good contraction. The common clinical scenario where you have a large BVRU in urinary bladder is a patient who has pranic urinary retention and he has not gone to a state of dilated upper urinary tract. Some diabetics who have cystopathy or somebody who has a large bladder diverticulum. And then there are some patients who are on long-term antipsychotic medications. So all these patients develop a weak detrusor muscle because of which they show up large PVRU. So one category would be somebody who has a large PVRU. And second category will be a patient who has no issue with PVRU, but as such, he is living with a large urinary bladder and he has thin walled urinary bladder. These are the patients like somebody who is very old, more than 80 years of age. There are some people who are who have been a water drinker for a long time, many, many years, like alcoholics. They retain large amount of urine in their bladder. So the bladder becomes very big. There are some people who are compulsive retainers of urine in their bladder. So all these have large urinary bladder and thin urinary bladder and they may not have sufficient detrusor pressure. So if you have either of these categories of the patient in preoperative period, you should actually suspect the patient may be having underactive detrusor. And such patients who, whom I call high risk individuals for a unsatisfactory outcome after transvital resection, you should identify all these patients preoperatively rather than facing the issue afterwards and be liberal with the use of urodynamic evaluation to diagnose that was under activity. And my feeling is that these patients should be offered a period of preoperative intermittent cell catheterization or if they cannot do it, a preoperative indwelling catheterization. I personally prefer pain intermittent catheterization and I not only train the patient but I also train the caregivers so that if in the post-operative period such a situation arises that patient is not able to void well he can continue his pain intermittent catheterization and I have noted in my experience that many patients gradually gradually start voiding normally or reasonably. So this clean intermittent catheter before TURP and after TURP is a good way to go about. So suppose you did not suspect underactivity bladder or else somebody else has operated the patient and the patient has come to you after he did not void well after TURP. He has come to you for second opinion. In that kind of scenario, how do you diagnose this problem? For diagnosis, you need a Euroflow test which will show you a low flow state, an ultrasound, which will show you high post void residual urinary volume, a urodynamic study, which will show you a low pressure voiding, and also a voiding cystogram or MCU, which will show you a normal outlet because you've done a good transfer resection, but still large PVRU in the bladder. So you use these four tests to diagnose this clinical problem. The uniform in these patients looks something like this. The patient is voiding intermittently. He's voiding in small spurts with abdominal straining. So bit by bit he voids 
and tries to empty himself. When you do a pressure flow study, you will get this kind of curve where the PT at maximum is below, you know, 10, 15 or something like that. And his flow is not good. So it's a low pressure, low flow diagnosis. If patient has undergone a cystogram, it will show you smooth bladder, large bladder like that. And when he voids, his bladder neck is open, prostatic cavity is open. The contrast is flowing down the urethra nicely. There's no stricture in the urethra anywhere. Meatus is fine. But you'll find as if he's trying to strain to void. And then at the end of voiding, he will be left behind with significant post void test the urinary volume. So such is the standard MCU of underactive bladder. Some patients can have a picture like this where in filling cystogram you discover a kind of a diverticular. I hope you can make out that there is a small shadow behind the bladder shadow. If I outline with the red, that's here it is. And if you take a lateral picture, a big diverticulum is hidden behind the urinary bladder. Now these patients will not void after transfer reception because voiding pressure will get dissipated into the diverticular cavity. So the underactive intruder, having diagnosed that, how do you treat? Diverticulum, of course, will require a surgical erection. But in general, you have to give these patients some kind of psychotherapy. You reassure the patient because the patient gets very frustrated. He has suffered a long period of symptoms before TURP and after a TRIURP also he continues to have same symptoms. So he's very frustrated. You have to rebuild his confidence. So psychotherapy is very essential. You can ask him to do clean intermittent cell catheter, as I said in the beginning. So you tell the patient that this is a physiotherapy of urinary bladder. You are making bladder to empty itself at least four times a day. And that is what a normal human being does, voids four times in a day. So the bladder is made to empty four times in a day. And in between, it is allowed to gradually, gradually refill. So it's a kind of physiotherapy for urinary bladder. And due course of time, you may improve. Some patients do improve in post-operative period. Then you can give them some kind of pharmacotherapy and this is a very questionable area that whether the drugs work, whether the bethanacol works in this situation or not. But uh, uh, literature may speak to you otherwise that it does not work well and randomized trials do not show the bethanacol is useful. But if you ask my personal opinion, I have found this useful in some patients. And difficult to predict which patient will respond, which patient will not respond, probably because of his in, innate, you know, metabolism and drug clearance issues. Some patients respond, some do not. Uh, we have used in past in some patients metadotromide also. This drug also works on detrusive muscle by dopaminergic pathways. Then all of these patients must have a clear bowel. If they are constipated, they will not void well. So please manage their constipations. So you look into these four areas, give him psychotherapy, physiotherapy of urinary bladder, pharmacotherapy to augment contraction of detrusor, and bowel therapy to clear constipation. If you pay attention to all these four areas, the patient will improve. And finally, the prostate factor. You have taken care of underactivity or underactivity was not there at all. But there's a prostate factor. How do you diagnose the prostate factors? And how do you treat this prostate factor? So as I said that some patients have blood clots. You remove the catheter and patient is having mild hematuria and he is strained to void and he bled a little more and the clots accumulated in the prostatic cavity. Some of them came in the bladder lumen and they are causing him obstruction in voiding. Ultrasound will show you the blood clots and this situation is kind of an emergency situation. So I would suggest that you take the patient to OT and do emergency cystoscopic clot removal, then only patient will start voiding. Now of course you take care of the reason why did he bleed. So blood clots is a kind of emergency semi-emergency situation. But if patient is voiding and he is not having hematuria, then the second reason would be again 
residual prostate. Now, when do you suspect residual prostate? You should suspect if, if you don't think that there is an underactivity of the urinary bladder and you are not able to find out any other cause. And if on digital electrical examination, some prostate is felt, particularly towards the pecs, or on transrectal examination, some prostate is seen particularly towards the apex, then, then this is a case of a residual prostate responsible for persistent blood outflow obstruction. And you can diagnose this by a pressure flow study, which will show a high PDAC. Say this is the normal prostate anatomy. You can have various patterns of residual prostate. The most common pattern is this, where you've done a resection more towards bladder neck, and then it has made the prostate prostate free, some apical tissue is left, and as the patient voids, this free prostate falls ahead of the urinary stream, and patient is not able to void. This is the most common pattern. But you can have this kind of pattern also, we have done in the section all along the prostate, and lateral lobes have been left behind. Or another pattern, where in one lobe you have significant apical tissue, and the other lobe you have most of the prostate tissue. This happens when the operator encounters excessive bleeding from sinus somewhere and he has to stop it. Here's one example of a patient who was not voiding well after a transuterine resection of a very large prostate, 80 for am or so. But this is a retrograde urethrogram which shows you the contrast going in the prostatic cavity and also in the bladder. The urethra is alright and in the cystogram you notice that some contrast is filled in the large prostatic cavity in the upper part of the prostatic cavity. In the lateral view, when patient voids and you shoot the film, you will notice that prostatic cavity is filling up. Some contrast is trickling down in the urethra, so it's voiding in a poor stream. And if you see anteriorly uh, in this part where arrows are coming up, there's some bulge here. This is the bulge of residual prostate. When this patient strained further, he voided. But I would like you to see here that the contrast is, ex is going into seminal vesicles, contrast is going into both vas differences, and contrast is going even up to epididymis. So the prostatic cavity is so widely open, the ejaculatory ducts have become refluxing. That's why he was able to see seminal vesicles and both vasa and both epididymis. And this is the post white cystogram. And again, you can see both nice vas difference and and epididymis, if you see here, that is here is the residual prostate. So a good voiding study will diagnose the residual prostate. Here's another example of a patient who is having a residual pythal prostate following transuterine resection, and he is not able to void satisfactorily. So if you have prostatic factors, how to treat? So obviously a residual prostate, you have to if it is a pical tissue, you have to redo the transuterine resection. But if it is the lateral lobar tissue, then there have been some, some clinical situations where patients have been given a combination therapy of alpha blockers and glutastrite therapy, although this is very, very debatable. But I have myself used it. It works in some patients. If a patient takes it for three to six months, some people become all right. A third clinical scenario, wherein after TURP, the patient is discharged. He goes home satisfactorily. He's passing stream nicely. No problems. But he comes back to you after four to six weeks with severe degree of obstructive and storage low urinary symptoms. In this third clinical scenario, let me talk in this presentation about what has gone wrong and why has that all happened? And this must be the question in the mind of the patient. Actually, these patients develop some kind of urethral narrowing. And this urethral narrowing can happen at all locations from external urinary meters to the bladder neck. It can happen in all sizes, short, medium, long. And it can happen in all kinds of severities. If you see, the normal anatomy of a male after transuterine resection, and that is how the, the spongiosal tissue and urethra 
the bladder neck looks like. This is normal arrangement. You can have uterine narrowing at the level of external uterine meatus, known as meatal structure. You can have a narrowing at the level of Zulsa, just proximal to fossa navicularis. You can have a narrowing at pino vulvar junction in form of a medium-sized structure. You can have narrowing in the proximal bulbar area, or you can have narrowing in membranous urethra, or you can have a narrowing at the level of bladder neck. The narrowing at the level of bladder neck is known as bladder neck stenosis, while all the narrowings in urethra are known as urethral structures. You can have a very serious type of structure in some patients, and that is a complete uterine vault what is known as pan structure. So the question must be coming to your mind. Why does this uterine structure or bladder neck stenosis occur after transuterine resection? If you understand this problem in this way, that there will be certain intraoperative factors which will result in this kind of issue. And there are certain factors which exist in the patient prior to that TURP is done and the certain factors which exist after TURP has been done. So they are known as accordingly pre-TURP factors and post-TURP factors. If I were to sum up to you first the intraoperative factors and try and explain to you what are those factors which play a role while you are doing transvertical resection which ultimately end up in structure formation after four to six weeks or a bladder neck stenosis after four to six weeks. See, suppose this is stitcher urethra. The main flaw here is healing by fibrosis. This can result either from the mechanical trauma when you are introducing the receptoscope sheath in the urethra at that time. It can be frictional injury, abrasive injury, from the tip of the sheath. There may be introduction of fresh infection or exacerbation of previous infection in the urethra. There can be ischemia in the wall of the urethra or at the level of bladder neck or at the level of osanamicularis by a rigid sheath placed inside the uterine lumen. Or there can be a back leak of current from the sheath which comes from tip of the sheath and wherever the sheath is in contact with the urethra, there will be leakage of current or there can be excessive thermal injury where you are resecting by transuterine resection. If you do over cautery, deep cuts, then thermal injury can result. So these are four independent type of factors which occur in varying severity to give rise to structural atrium. But then you must also remember that all these factors can get interrelated and one leads to the other kind of pathology and they are, you know, operational in their own way. Now, if you consider all these four factors in a patient of structure stenosis and you are answering why, if you consider all those four factors, not everything plays a role in everybody. Out of these four a one may be a dominant feature, like in somebody, a pressure ischemia is a dominant feature. Or in other person, an infection is a dominant feature. Or in other person, there can be three factors dominating as a etiological factor for causation of structure. So if I were to tell you which factor is the most important factor at which site. So for example, if you have a stenosis, in meatus, meatal stenosis or meatal structure at the level of external meatus as seen in this picture. In this case, the major reason for development of meatal stenosis is pressure ischemia, which you create during transuterine section. And how do you create that? For instance, in the picture here, this is a patient who is undergoing transuterine section and during the reception, patient develops marked erection your receptoscope sheath may fall short and you have to press it in to reach up to the level of bladder neck, particularly if the prostate gland is also large and it has significant intravesical protrusion. 
so the the back of the sheath is squeezing compressing on the meters for as long as you're doing the section and subsequently it will result in this kind of problem metal infection metal necrosis the part of the glandular area is also getting necrosed and it will result in this kind of metal structure later on in some patients where you apply a gauge piece traction at the level of meters in this manner and if you leave this gauge piece there for more than 15 20 minutes then this is a severe pressure at the level of meters and this can also result into a subsequent metal stenosis in another situation of structure at the level of urethra just proximal to posterior and if you were to understand what is, are the etiological factors here the main factor is mechanical trauma now, at the time of introduction of the sheath when you introduce your sheath the sharp edge of the sheath can rub as it enters from wide fossa navicularis to narrow urethra there is a change in the caliber so at this point there is a frictional injury abrasive injury which results into uh, structure later on at this point of course there can be pressure ischemia in some patient by a wider catheter but mechanical trauma is a main factor in a third location where you get pino bulbar structure and if you were to ask me what reasons here the main reason is pressure ischemia and also the leakage of current because it is here the urethra is angulated during transurethral section and it is here a wider part of sheath remains in contact with the urethral wall the leakage of electrical current can give rise to structure formation the pressure ischemia at this point is dominantly because of the traction that you apply on the catheter most common way of applying traction on the catheter is that you anchor and secure the catheter shaft to the thigh of the patient and you exert a pull in order to exert pressure on the operated fossa and to arrest bleeding as shown in this picture because of this persistent pull the urethra remains bent ventrally at the level of pinobulbar junction and subsequently patient may get structure here in order to prevent this there is another way of putting traction where you fix the catheter to the abdominal wall in the manner shown here so thigh traction is the culprit in either location at proximal bulbar area where you see often see a very short structure at this point and again you ask me which is the main factor responsible here i would say mechanical trauma because when you introduce the sheath it goes straight up to the proximal bulb and then you have to bend the penis down to enter the bladder and as you change the direction of the tip of the sheath here often trauma occurs and subsequently gives rise to stretcher infection can also be either a part later on at the level of bladder neck the reasons for stretcher formation out of these four most important reason is electrical thermal injury when you perform a deep resection at the level of bladder neck this is the main factor and again when you put a catheter traction and you expect the full balloon to exert tamponade at the level of bladder neck to occlude the bleeders then if you allow this balloon traction to stay on for some more time it can subsequently result in pressure ischemia and the stricture afterwards in some patients you develop this disease a pan with structure and then again if you ask me the reasons for it out of these four infection inside the entire urethra or in some patients the allergic response to the catheter material or some kind of chemical used during the surgery which gives rise to an extensive inflammatory reaction in the entire urethra and a pan with structure results some people feel it can even be due to electrical leakage of the current through the sheath or the pressure of the sheath in the urethra so all four factors will be there but i am telling you which is the most dominant factor so i hope you have understood that at different sites in the urethra structure results and at each site the major etiological factor major intraoperative etiological factor is different 
then talking to you about what are the major pre-operative and post-operative factors. This is the kind of situation where you have the catheter in the urethra and in pre-operative stage, many patients are on in sterile urinary retention and they live on catheter for some time before they go for surgery. In developing country, they live on catheter for some time, even months, because they have to arrange for resources and people will look after them. So there are certain factors which are there because of the catheter. They are called catheter factors. For example, if there's a trauma during insertion of catheter or during the change of the catheter, or if there's an infection in urethra during insertion of catheter, or if there is pressure ischemia because of malpositioning of the catheter, then all these catheter-induced factors can accentuate the intraprocedural factors. You can have some degree of infection present in the low urinary tract already. And for some reason, patient underwent the operation with infection present either in urethra or in the bladder lumen or even in the prostate gland. There are certain host factors also. And the host factors are like diabetes, if it is uncontrolled, or somebody who has been irradiated on low urinary tract, or somebody who is in general immunocompromised. And these are the patients who have a dominant fibroblastic response to any kind of trauma which occurs on urethra and prostate, and it will result in healing by fibrosis. Now, all these factors, catheter factors, low urinary tract factors, host factors, they not only play a role in pre-operative period, but they also play a role in post-TURP stage. And you can have a continuum of these insults. So now, if somebody asks you that what are the etiological factors responsible for post-TURP bladder stenosis, and if you understood me well, when I said you have pre-operative factors, also called pre-TURP factors, which will include if the patient has a prostate which is already diseased by a disease because of which there will be more fibrotic response, like patients who have chronic prostatitis, there are some patients who have small prostate which is more fibrous, and there are some patients who have prostatic abscess, multiple abscesses, and when the healing occurs in these prostates, the healing response is more fibroblastic. Those who are smokers, those who have radiation exposures, they can have a more degree of possibility of developing bladder neck stenosis. Then there are intraoperative factors and there are postoperative factors. Again, postoperative factors are long duration traction applied to bladder neck or a patient who persists with urine injection after the operation. And in intraoperative factors, I mentioned to you, if you do a deep resection at the level of bladder neck and a lot of deep muscle fibers are exposed and you have to do a lot of pottery to uh, control the bleeders all around. And in some unfortunate patients, if you create subtribunal kind of injury. So friends, look at this flow diagram. And you will notice that in a patient, often there are multiple factors responsible for this kind of unfortunate happen. If you suspect a useful structure formation, how will you diagnose this problem? Which means, where the structure has occurred and how bad is the problem. So what we should do, you should first of all do a meticulous clinical examination of external urinary meters, palpate the urethra of the patient, the penile as well as the bulbar, and then do a digital lateral examination to assess the prostate and the induration there. Then you ask the patient to have a test called urophometry, wherein you see the, the kind of stream he's producing. And then asks for a retrograde urethrogram and also avoiding cystrogram. So that is the way the patient is evaluated. When you do a urophometry test and check post white residual urinary volume, you often get this kind of a constrictive urophometry pattern, which is also known as a box kind of pattern. This is indicative of useless structure disease. 
I'll be giving you the examples of structures at different different location, and what will be the finding of the retrograde euthogram and voiding euthogram mainly. Now, this is the kind of problem which can create because of watch piece traction or because of the compression at the level of meters, the healing by second intention, or something like this, or in another patient, a more serious problem like this. And all these problems will eventually result in a healing by scarring, and the patient will then come back to you with medial stenosis. Now, from the time of onset, which is at the time of the, the operative procedure, it usually takes four to six weeks for this level of obstruction to come. And that is why patients go home, they pass you in, they have some pain at the meters, but because they are old and they do not pay attention to the local site, they themselves do not know what is going wrong. Until and unless somebody sees there. So often these patients will come to you after four to six weeks. How do you diagnose the presence of a stricture in the urethra proximal to fossa navicularis or sometimes even in the fossa navicularis? If you look at the meters and try to open this, you will be able to open it. So external urinary meters will look to you normal. But then when you palpate the area of the fossa navicularis or the urethra just proximal to it by pinching the penis between thumb and index finger tip, in a manner shown here, then you will notice that you can feel a knot kind of thing there. You can feel an indurated area there, which is because of the a tough stretcher. Now, when you do a retrograde urethrogram in a normal patient after transuterine section, this is the kind of appearance that you get. When contrast goes in the urethra, it will show you kind of a tubular area. Often you don't notice a dilated bulb. Because there is hardly any resistance in the prostatic urethra, the contrast flows freely into the bladder. So that's why bulb may not distend. And urethra will look like to you a narrow tube. And in most patients, you will see a funnel open prostatic urethra and widely open bladder neck. So this is the normal appearance of retrograde urethrogram after TURP. And if you see a normal Maturating cyst urethrogram after TURP, this is how it looks. It's normal bladder, widely open bladder neck, dilated prostatic urethra, and contrast flowing down easily in the normal patent urethra. That's how it looks. But if you see a patient who has developed either a medial stenosis or a structure proximal to fossa navicularis, and then when you do a MCU in these patients, the contrast will flow down from bladder, bladder neck into urethra and will distend the urethra. The urethra here will look to you like this, distended. And then if you have careful eyes and see that stream, you will notice that the patient is passing a very thin stream, straight stream, as shown in this picture. In either MCU of a patient who has a navicular structure, you will notice the same thing again. Urethra full, urethra overfull, the standard, and then narrowing at the level of meters and thin stream. So MCU is a, a test for diagnosing the structure in the area of osinavicularis. For pedobulbar structures, main investigation is that to get urethrogram, and it will show you, in, as in this patient, a short segment structure at pedobulbar location. In this patient, a medium sized structure at pedobulbar location. Please notice a dilated prostatic urethra, then a long segment, a pedobulbar structure. So, as I said, at pedobulbar location, you can have short structure, medium structure, long structure, all kinds. In the area of proximal bulbar area, often the structure is short because it is due to the mechanical trauma by the tip of the sheath. And see here, structure in proximal bulb and a dilated prostatic urethra. Again, either patient, a short segment, proximal bulbar structure, dilated prostatic urethra. You can also have MCU done in both RGU and MCU. Say, for example, in this patient, RGU is showing you one end of the structure. And when you do MCU, it will show you a markedly dilated prostatic urethra 
and then going into the symptom urethra and proximal bulb, and then you see a tight proximal vulvar structure. For long pubervulval structure, and you do a retrograde urethrogram, you notice this is the area of the urethra which has been narrowed down. Again, all kinds of factors, pressure by the sheet, pressure by the catheter, some degree of infection, some degree of optical back leakage, all those things resulting into this kind of problem to the patient. In some patients, you have two structures, one at pre-bulbar location and another at the proximal bulb. Some patients develop pan urethral structures. And when you do retrograde urethrogram, this is how it will look like. And urethra is looking like a pipe stem to you. You can even see uh, three later glands in the penile urethra here. And then when you do MCU, you notice this same thin caliber urethra. And through thin caliber urethra, patient is able to produce a thin stream. If the patient has already developed a post urp urethral structure, how will you treat him? And what are the important points that you should keep in your mind? If the patient has come to you very early following transurethral resection, his urethra has actually developed edema and reaction and the fibrotic process is in the initial stage of fibroblastic reaction. So it is actually some kind of unstable edematous urethra. And if you do a sequential dilatation of this urethra over a guide wire under an intensifier and tell the patient to do clean self dilatation at home. And some people like to use topical clovatasol in the urethra. You can have good results. But if the patient has come a little late and your clinical assessment is telling you that the disease process is actually more fibrotic, then you will have to consider doing oral mucosal graft urethroplasty for these patients. Now let me try and explain to you on the basis of different location of structures that can happen following transurethral resection. Suppose the patient has natal urethral structure alone. So as I said, initially you can do dilatation over the guide wire and tell the patient to do self-dilatation subsequently. So here is the case of medial structure. And you can do this dilatation over a guide wire using fascial dilators. Or some people try and use a metal dilator under anesthesia. And thereafter, we give our patients this small plastic dilator. This can be cleaned at home. And they can apply tovetasol uh, over this dilator and insert this into their meatus once a day or twice a day for some weeks and this problem of meatal structure can be easily solved. Those patients who have penile urethral structure alone and again if they have come at a very early stage you can do dilatation over the guide wire and teach the patient self-dilatation regimen for some time. In one of our videos on YouTube I have explained to you how to do the sequential fluoroscopic dilatation of penile urethral structure and you can see that for details. I want to share with you some results of this methodology of dilatation followed by self-dilatation by the patient and topical intraurethral clobetasol application. Here is a case of long penile urethral structure and then this was after a few months of dilatation and cell dilatation. And this is the picture after six months. I'm sure you'll appreciate the gradual improvement in the condition of urethra. Here is a case of a structure pre-dilatation. And here is a case of the same patient after six months of dilatation. So dilatation, if done in carefully selected patients, where urethra is not very fibrotic, you can get reasonably good result. But if you have done dilatation a few times or the patient has come in a late stage and you think it's very fibrotic, refractory penile urethral structure, these patients will require uh, oral mucosal graft urethroplasty in a long area, something like the one shown in this picture. There are some patients who will come with penile urethral structure and also have residual prostate. These patients require dilatation and not only that, 
the residual prostate should be resected for improvement. And after that, of course, patient will go on self dilatation regimen. Now, here is a patient who has stricture as well as sufficient amount of residual prostate. He will require this kind of treatment. Then the patient may have stricture in the bulbar urethra. Again, some patients will have stricture with residual apical prostate or residual one lobe, depending upon what the previous surgeon has done. So you have to combine DVIU along with apical resection and follow it with self dilatation. But most patients have bulbar uterus stricture without residual prostate. So it's normal, nicely done PURP, but a small stricture. These patients require cystoscopic dilatation or a DVIU. You can choose either of these two methods and then put the patient on self dilatation regimen. Now, I would like you to look at this urethra here. This is a normal urethral appearance. The structure post URP can develop in distal bulb, and this is then called post URP distal bulbar urethral structure. But some patients can develop proximal structure, and this is called proximal bulbar urethral structure. You should be able to define with the help of urethrograms whether it is a distal bulbar structure or a proximal bulbar structure. That differentiation is important. Uh, here is a urethrogram of a patient who has a proximal short segment bulbar urethral structure following the URP. Now, these structures should better be dilated because if you cut them and they are close to centric mechanism, you run the risk of injuring the uh, sphincter gas. Now, this is a patient of a post URP urethral structure. And as you advance the cystoscope here, you notice a small structure, which is easily dilatable. But most significant structure is located in the bulbous urethra. Now, these structures can be dilated under vision. You pass a guide wire inside it. And over the guide wire, you can gently exert some pressure and you can advance your cystoscope sheet easily inside as done, as done here. Now you will appreciate by looking at the prostatic fossa that there is healing going on. So it's a case of a very early structure disease and dilatation done once followed by cell dilatation should give you a reasonable outcome. If the patient has a refractory distal bulbar urethral structure, distal, then you will have to do oral mucosal graft urethroplasty. And here in distal bulb, we recommend that you place a dorsal mucosal graft. If the patient has a proximal bulbar structure and you want to do a oral mucosal graft with the plasty, such as here, you should put a ventral mucosal graft because putting a dorsal graft in this location in proximal bulbar structure becomes very tricky and you go very close to symptom mechanism. So you run the risk of creating post urp incontinence. If you do a ventral bulbar graft, nothing happens. And you can close this nicely. Another area of narrowing, which is at the level of bladder neck. Now, bladder neck stenosis previously was called post URP bladder neck contracture. But today, the SIU ICDS consultation group has specified that you call it post URP bladder neck stenosis. So that's the word we shall be using hands on. Now, if you see a normal prostatic fossa, after a well-done transuther resection, it should look something like this. Baru Montanum, right? And then as you go in, you will see widely open bladder neck and supple bladder neck, no scarring. It's all round, white. The fossa is well epithelized. But then some patients develop stenosis at the level of bladder neck. Now, I would like you to show some representative retrograde utheran pictures here is a patient who has normal anterior urethra, but you will appreciate there is some narrowing at the level of bladder neck. In this urethrogram, you will appreciate narrowing at the level of a fine streak of contrast is going in the bladder. In this patient, again, you will notice the same thing. A dilated prostatic urethra and a fine streak going across the stenotic segment of bladder neck into bladder. In this patient, as the technician injects contrast in urethra, and then it meets the resistance at the level of bladder neck, there's a positive pressure 
So the yutha looks very distended. The entire penile, bulbar, sphincteric, membranous, prostatic yutha is distended. And you can also see some backflow of contrast in prostatic ducts. This is because of high pressure in this part of the urethral segment. And then the contrast is escaping into the stenotic segment and then into the bladder. In this patient, which is the worst type of bladder neck stenosis, not even a drop of contrast is going into the bladder. And it is dilating the prostatic urethra and as well as creating reflux into prostatic ducts. So you have seen these varieties of bladder neck stenosis. Here again, in another patient, complete block at the level of bladder neck stenosis. There may be small passage somewhere. Patient is trickling urine. Now I want you to have a look at these three retrograde urethrograms and concentrate at the level of bladder neck in all these three. Do you think that the degree of the disease process resulting into bladder neck stenosis is same in all the patients? I don't think so. The disease severity is, is variable and therefore the treatment should also vary in these patients. In clinical practice, you will have lots of variations in the morphology of bladder neck stenosis. The stenotic segment will vary in the length. Length, I mean vertical length. Then the degree of fibrotic process will be variable in terms of the depth. And then the location of the stenotic hole will also vary. So these things will be variable in all the patients. If this is the normal appearance of the prostatic fossa and bladder neck after a good transfer section, and you want to learn what variations are possible in the location of bladder neck stenosis, this is a snow bladder neck at the center hole. In most patients, you will notice that this hole is displaced more towards the 12 o'clock, like that. So it's anteriorly located towards, you know, if you examine the patient in lithotomy, you will notice this hole is not in the center but it is more towards the, the anterior part, the 12 o'clock in the vision. Regarding the variation in depth of fibrosis, if you look at this bladder stenosis, and I have tried to show you with the white thing, adjoining the stenotic hole, the fibrotic component, which can be very thin, or it can be as deep, or it can be as deep. So the fibrotic process, the depth-wise, the scar, will depth wise will also vary. In terms of the length, the vertical length, the stenotic segment can be very flimsy, mucosal flimsy, like the one here. You're doing a cystoscopy of a patient who has come to you with the obstructed low urinary symptom. And then as you go into the prostatic urethra, you will see the area of the stenosis. Now here I'd like you to observe the most of the resection has been done at the level of bladder neck. In the area of X and the lower part of the prostate operator has not done much job. And this is the hole, it's not a hole, which is looking like a very thin, flimsy, membranous septum between the prostatic urethra and bladder. So you pass a guide wire through that hole and over the guide wire, just try to advance your scope. You will notice that without much resistance, just by small click, you will go inside the bladder and this fibrous septum is torn and that's how the interior of the bladder is. No evidence of infection, not much of a problem, normal orifices and uh, as you come out, you will see the, you will see the, the, look at the edges of the broken septum. It's very thin edges. They are bleeding also a little bit. So part of the job you have done by opening this obstruction and as now the patient will void, this defect will open more and more, more and more, and most of the patients remain okay. So this is an example of a thin fibrotic bladder neck stenosis. In some patients, the, the vertical length, the vertical height of this bladder neck stenosis can be longer, more, and it can be spanning into area of five to 10 millimeter. Here is another video and uh, I'd like you to appreciate the difference in the severity of disease in this case vis-a-vis -vis the one that you saw earlier. Sometimes you take time in finding out where is the area of the snow's uh, 
bladder neck. Now look at this bladder neck, which is a thick bladder neck stenosis. And again, you can put a wire, a uretic catheter through that narrow hole. And if you want to dilate with the cystoscope sheath, and the amount of pressure that you have to exert will tell you that how bad is the fibrotic process. You can push it, but you need to exert, and then you can go inside the urinary bladder. So obviously, the, the, the element of fibrosis in this case is far more as compared to what was there in the earlier case. And this is the third situation where the vertical length of stenotic segment is longer than a centimeter. It does not involve the bladder neck alone, but it involves the, the proximal prostatic urethra also. So friends, clinical variants, therefore, can be many. You can have a case of bladder neck stenosis alone, or you can have a case of bladder neck stenosis with another obstructive factor. Till now, I told you what are the different grades of bladder neck stenosis alone. But then you can have this combined with another obstructive factor in the low urinary tract, either a stricture or a residual prostate. So you have to diagnose everything and then treat the patient. Here's a video of a patient who has uh, adhesions in the area of bladder neck and he also have some residual prostate. Now look at this video carefully as you advance the scope through the sphincteric urethra and the well montanum view. The one though the prostate is grown more and you on top part of the endoscopic vision you notice a semilunar adhesion. A semil that's it. And as it advances inside, the adhesion is broken. And the lobes get separated. So this was a partial adhesion which was not allowing the lateral lobes to fall apart at the time of widening. The adhesion was beginning from this location. You can see fresh bleeding because of recent attempt to tear the adhesion. And this adhesion was just distilled to bladder neck between one part of the prostatic lobe with the other prostatic lobe. So such situations can happen in clinical practice. Here, you need to resect this residual prostate also if you want your patient to have a good outcome. There are many clinical variants. For example, there may be a patient of bladder stenosis alone or there may be a patient who has bladder stenosis along with stricture down below in the urethra as in this case. There may be a patient who has bladder neck stenosis as well as significant amount of residual prostate. So both the problems. Now here's a video of a patient where you can see the residual apical lobes and the bladder neck, which is not nicely open. And this is a case who is evolving into bladder neck stenosis. And you do not know what will happen in future. He may develop more stenosis in future. If I were to give you a small uh, algorithm of managing these patients, if the patient has a short segment, vertically, the vertical height is more like a septum of blood neck stenosis and the degree of contracture process is very superficial or else on the other side, if the patient has a vertically long segment of stenosis and the degree of fibrotic process is very deep and more. So you isolate these patients into this group. The later group, which is more serious, it requires transurethral incision under anesthesia. And if the patient has residual apical tissue also, along with the incision, do a repeat transurethral resection of residual prostate. But if the patient has the simpler variety, short segment, typhonous membrane like blood stenosis, you, and the patients come very early, you can do a fluoroscopic dilatation of that narrow bladder neck over a guide wire under local anesthesia. Or you can do a cystoscopic dilatation as I showed you. After cystoscopic dilatation, these patients should be asked to do a cell dilatation. 
and thus they can maintain their blood outlet normally. If the patient fails, he goes for transuterine incision or whatever the case requires. Now let me show you a fluoroscopic video of a patient who had a very fine, thin, septum-like blood tank stenosis. And in this patient, we have put in a guide wire to the urethra and to the bladder neck, into the bladder. And then this is the contrast is being injected. You will appreciate that narrow area of stenosis to the bladder neck. Just below that, the contrast is showing you dilated prostatic urethra. And over the wire, you advance this single stage dilator. In some of my videos on YouTube, I have shown you the use of this one stage uh, urethral dilator, which has been developed by me. You can use any facial dilator to do this job. The entire process is done under fluoroscopic control under local anesthesia. After that, patient will void normally. You can do a dilatation to a greater degree by following wider dilators of 20 French or 22 French to make the caliber of bladder neck even bigger. This patient has again post URP bladder outer obstructive symptoms and as you put your scope inside you will notice a stenosed bladder neck here and this is I would say not a very bad case of bladder neck stenosis. It's a thinner septum, right? As you put your scope in this gets dilated by the scope. So look at the thin edges. Right? So this is a simple case of blood neck stenosis with not much of fibrotic process. Once dilated, patients do fine. Here is another case of blood neck stenosis. Let's, let's see what is there in the patient. This is Verum Montanum. And as you go close to bladder neck, you notice a narrow bladder neck. Look at the location of the bladder neck, narrow bladder neck. It's towards the 12 o'clock of endoscopic vision. And then you are trying to put pressure in the sheath to enter the bladder. And gradually, gradually, you, you go inside the bladder. And then as you come out, you will see the effect of dilatation on the bladder neck. You will notice some white scar. Now this patient will recur with the bladder neck stenosis. The cystoscopic dilatation will not be enough. You can buy time with it, but subsequently he will require a regular blood neck incision. Now, this is another patient who has a scarred bladder neck. The blood neck hole is anteriorly located. If you have doubt, you can confirm this by passing a guide wire. But here, the anterior hole is the bladder neck. You put this uretic catheter in that narrow bladder neck, and then you can advance the scope over the uretic catheter and examine the bladder form inside. And this step is necessary to allow the introduction of the receptor scope sheath through this bladder neck. And then you remove the guide wire and uretic catheter and place your uh, receptoscopic system inside it. It is important to assess the location of uretic orifices before you begin incision of the stenosis bladder neck. And now you cut at uh, 7 o'clock by Collins knife. Some people feel laser is more useful here, but I find Collins knives very quick. And uh, if you have right setting of the cutting currents, it does not induce excessive fibrosis. So you have to make deep incisions on the seven o'clock location at one side and having made that sufficiently deep, having made the incision on one side, you move to the incision on the other side a similar procedure is done at uh, 5 o'clock location. So you are creating bilateral two trenches and the fibrotic ring 
is cut at two places and most patients do well after this operation. There is some recurrence rate, but it's a, in my view, it's a fairly uncommon. So this is the appearance of bladder neck after bilateral bladder neck incision. During the incision, by the side of Veru Montanum on both sides. So that's the final picture of bilateral incision of the granding stenosis, also the residual prostate. Now here the other patient, there's some small structure in the urethra, which is soft structure and easily dilated with the sheath. This is where one tannum. And you see more upwards into prostatic urethra. It's sometimes difficult to locate the blood neck stenosis, right? So there's where it is, an anteriorly located contractured bladder neck. You can enter the bladder with gentle force and examine. So appreciate the degree of fibrotic process in this patient. And on transsectoral ultrasound, this patient had reasonable residual prostate as well. First, you begin making bladder neck incisions as you would do for any patient of bladder neck stenosis. So we did on him one bladder neck incision on at 7 o'clock. You will appreciate that as you are cutting this area, you will see adenomatous tissue prostate on either side of your incision. So this is a significant amount of residual prostate. An incision alone uh, may not be sufficient uh, job to relieve the blood outflow obstruction. So another incision made on the five o'clock location. Here also at the edges of the incision, you notice that there is a reasonable amount of residual prostatic tissue. So these are operators subjective assessment. So now you take a regular sectoscope blue and it is better to resect whatever residual prostate tissue you are seeing below the bladder neck. And that was what was done in this patient. Gradually, gradually you resect the prostate below the bladder neck and give the patient a wide open bladder outlet. This is the resected tissue inside the bladder. So friends, if you encounter a simple case of bladder like stenosis, you should try to do an endoscopic treatment, right? Either a bladder neck incision, you can do BNI with cold knife, hot knife, laser, whatever is your choice. Uh, some people recommend putting mitomycin C after bladder neck incision inside the bladder, or some people even recommend injecting trams in the lower at the area of the bladder neck. This, in their view, minimizes the recurrence of another episode of bladder neck stenosis. But this is, in clinical practice, uncommon. If the patient recurs, you can do, of course, either with bladder neck incision, but then if the patient keeps recurring again and again, you may have to resort to open reconstruction. And uh, there are some patients who have total complete occlusion, as I showed you in some of the pictures earlier. These patients may require uh, open reconstruction of bladder neck, but uh, uh, fortunately, this kind of occurrence is very, very uncommon. So thank you very much for your patient watching this video and listening to my views on management of bladder neck stenosis after the DURP. In case you have any questions or comments, you can write on my email or look at my website, the Academy of Urology. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah.
Hello, am I audible? Yeah, I see some queries in the chat box. Uh, query one, uh, when do you take out the catheter usually? See, as I said in my presentation, it depends upon the amount of resection that I have done. For most prostate, which are about 30 to 40 cc prostate glands, I would remove my catheter on third day or fourth day, depending upon whenever the hematuria clears, right? But if the prostate is not large, I resect around 100 cc of the prostate volume. Then I will keep the catheter for about a six to seven days time. And then I remove the catheter. Uh, query two, is there any cut of mark of post void residual urinary volume where one has to do a urodynamic study? Uh, as I understand from your question, you're asking is, what is the volume of PVRU over which you would recommend a pre-TURP urodynamic evaluation, right? I think usually when you recommend urodynamics, it's not one thing on, on the basis of which you recommend urodynamic. It is, one is PVRU, the other would be the uroflow metry curve pattern. If it is an interrupted flow pattern and you think patient is avoiding with the abdominal straining, that will also indicate you to do a urodynamic evaluation. Plus, patient who is very old, 80 years of age, a patient who has diabetes. So often you find a combination of factors which compel you to do a preoperative urodynamic evaluation. In my view, today, when you have free availability of urodynamic evaluation, uh, more, more often than not, you should tilt on the side of doing urodynamic evaluation prior to TURP because you can predict the outcome of the surgery. Right? So this is, this is a test that should be done before the URP. To query third. Drop down back. How do you go about in a patient who underwent? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. Somebody who had a BMG uthoplasty already and it requires trans resection. Now, this will depend upon the, uh, the caliber that you have in urethra. Unfortunately, you do not have a free availability of thin caliber resectoscopes. So you have to manage, you have to do uh, some dilatation over the wire using fascia dilators to get to the caliber of the sheath and then do a transuthal resection. That looks a simplistic uh, view. Otherwise, uh, if you don't want to disturb BMG urethroplasty at all, uh, maybe it is a case which is not very uh, sort of old urethroplasty. It's maybe six months before urethroplasty was done and you have to do a uh, URP. So you may do a perineal urethrostomy. And from there, you can do a transuthal resection if you have to. But so I think this situation will be very, very rare. Very, very rare. Clinically, very, very rare. Yes. Mm. You are BT. Yeah. yeah. Quinn, two so, options. Yes. True. One true. Two. Yeah. So uh, this looks more hypothetical than I, I actually not encountered anything such as till date. Till date. So can you move down on chat box? Which catheter is better for self dilation? Uh, see, there are many CIG catheters in our country available, various makers make it. Uh, I usually go by because it's kind of a one or two or three use catheter. You don't have to take a very stiff catheter. It should be free. Surface, you can use a silicon catheter also, but silicon catheter is soft and it may create a bit of problem. More important is that the eye of the catheter should not be very big. If you have a big eye of the catheter for cell dilatation, it becomes a problem sometimes. And I have not used tacrolimus uh, in any of my patients so far, so I'd not be able to give you an offhand experience. But I have read a couple of papers on tacrolimus in a post structure in, in these patients. But that's not used for bladderneck stenosis, used for structures down below. Dilatation sufficient for bladder stenosis. I showed you there are very, very select patients who have very thin septum or more membrane-like, more adhesions-like uh, 
ladder extensor so where you put your scope in once and if you tilt the scope left right up and down that moment can open blood less efficiently and i have done this in the videos i showed you there are three such patients which are very thin bladder neck stenosis and i did actually the part of diagnosis making and told the patient if you recur you come back to me and i will do a regular bni but none of them have come back right so in private sector they will always come back if you do a job and it's you're not giving good result they'll come back and tell you do me again so they're not so this is now next query how how you manage a long segment structure with grossly dilated and large prostate lobes on anti grade scopy kindly share your view you. see you will have to manage structure on the merit of the structure and prostate on the merit of the prostate now in this scenario where you said twin obstructions structure as well as the prostate this combination exists it exists but a less common and it exists because patient had bph had retention urine he was catheterized and the catheterization was not done nicely or a good quality catheter was not used and after removal of the catheter the patient developed stricture so the catheter gave him stricture and he, he had prostate obstruction to begin with now if you have this situation and if the stricture is not very established it's a soft fibroblastic kind of a narrowing of urethra more edema in the urethra and you're managing a early case you can dilate the urethra and do your job with the resection and later on tell the patient you have stricture also when the stricture matures i will treat it mean till the time patient can be put on clean self dilatation but uh, as i see in your question large prostate lobes will have to be dealt with later on by transurethral resection what is the advantage of pre op self dilatation self catheterization in a case of underactive bladder yeah. uh, the hang on hang on here pre op role of t op in proven case of underactive bladder on the recurrence rate structure the, uh, if a patient has underactive bladder and uh, you are seeing him and you are asking should you do a transurethral resection or not now if you read old literature of underactive bladder they have categorized the degree of underactivity if the pressure the pdat max is something close to 20 right 20 25 or little less than 20 then and if the prostate gland here is large more than 40 cc or so then if you do a prostatic resection you are doing kind of a balancing procedure right previously the bladder was not able to generate sufficient pressure and there was a outlet obstruction as well so patient could not void if you reduce the bladder outlet resistance this patient will void because whatever bladder contractility he has it is sufficient enough to push urinary bolus through an open bladder outlet now so this turp was the standard treatment for underactive bladder and then this was called as dr turner varve used to call this as a balancing procedure balance in the hydrodynamics of the lower urinary tract so i think you can do it you have to provided your bladder contracted is reasonable around 20 cm water pressure but if it is a contractile bladder does not generate any pressure here i like to repeat a urodynamic evaluation because more often than not i have found that this is a technical flaw in the performance of urodynamic test during the test at the particular day of the test the man was not comfortable the man was not the bladder was not sufficiently filled by the technician he was in the hurry something something went wrong and you recorded on the machine a contractile bladder but when you ask the patient outside the lab patient say oh, well i went to toilet after the test i passed 100 cc urine from from which mechanism tell me the patient will pass 100 cc urine in the flow so please remember every time urodynamic evaluation is not sacrosanct and you may have to repeat the test to decide should you do a turp in underactive bladder or should you not do a turp in underactive bladder what are the significance of size in development of structure you thought after turp the receptoscope sheath see in past when we were trained in transurethral resection way back 89 90 92 we had two sheaths for transurethral resection 24 and 27 for big prostate will use 27 strength sheath and that would cause structures but now we don't have such such situation you don't you have only one size so you have no choice 
right? Uh, call, I already mentioned in my talk. call, I said some patients respond, many patients do not respond. For us as a clinician, difficult to say which patient will respond, which patient will not respond. So the taste of the pudding is in testing it. So give call for a day, for a week, and tell the patient to come back and tell. Sometimes patients say they are feeling better. It may be placebo effect or the drug may be actually doing some job on them. So, but my personal feeling is it works in some patients. But then questionable is for how long you give. And I have no answer for this. There's no, there's no study on it. For how long should you give a call? One week, 10 days, three months? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Satyagash. And I thank the audience and thank uh, Alchem Eurocare for giving me this opportunity to express my views in this little uncommon but uh, uncommon subject, un very, very uncommonly talked about, but very commonly faced in clinical practice. So thank you very much. We have, uh, I, I know I've taken a little more time, Surprakash, but uh, it's my privilege and honor to introduce Dr. V. Surprakash to the audience here. And he's a fellow urologist from Hyderabad. Uh, Dr. Vadi Surprakash is urologist, andrologist, and a very renowned transplant surgeon. In the Department of Urology at Yashoda Hospitals, Soma Jiguda. He has been in, in, the, in this active clinical practice for 20 years. He has done over 150 renal transplants and is a member of many urological societies, USI and AUA. And I have known him personally through many conferences, through these webinars. And he's a very well read and very accomplished urologist. So you welcome Dr. Sur Prakash for your presentation. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks for a um, very detailed uh, presentation on the symptoms, objective symptom posture, and very really lucid presentation, sir. So now I, my talk will be like something like an extension of your talk, sir. No, 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 no. Uh, can you see the screen? Can you see the presentation? No, sir. Huh? No, sir. No? One second. One second. Good is Now, Dignesh, right? Sir, it's coming, but uh, now it's coming. Okay. Just me. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Sir, full screen. Ah, it's full screen. Is it visible? Slides are the slides visible? Is it full screen? Ah, Jignesh, bhai? Yeah, no. No, sir. Ajay, okay. Uh, sir, uh, do one thing. Just select sir. the first one. Screen option is just one. Sir. Stop sharing. Stop sharing ah. and select the first option. Stop sharing. Yes, sir. Stop share and select the first option. Okay, and share what? First option, the screen. Share screen, na? Huh? Uh, share screen. In that, there is a basic, there is a one option, screen. Uh -huh. First option, just select it. Okay. And share. Okay, now? 
सर इट्स कमिंग ऑन प्रेजेंटेशन मोड नॉट फुल मोड नाउ नाउ सर शेयरिंग इज स्टॉप अच्छा वन सेकेंड Uh, are the slides visible in English? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, a uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, and outside, I'd like to thank the uh, Ankhem Navakir for giving me the opportunity to talk on a very common and uh, interesting topic to all neurology, the structure related stuff. Of course, Dr. Dalila has uh, partly covered the endoscopic management of, and, and he's covered a little bit about the structure urethroplasty. So, I'll be focusing. Uh, mainly on the role of uh, substitution urethroplasty. So the outline of my talk in the next half an hour will be uh, briefly about uh, blood supply of urethral penile kit, surgical procedures for uh, anti-urethral stricture, mainly focusing on substitution urethroplasty, whether we use grafts or flaps, which one is better, and a few slides about bulbar urethral loss. Bulbar urethral loss is a very grave scenario where we lose a significant amount of urethra, how do we reconstruct that part? And what does the literature say about which one is good? Graft is better or flap is better? And how do you follow up these patients and what is the success of the class? So, uh, penile urethral reconstruction for structural urethra continues to be a challenging procedure because there is no one perfect procedure suitable for all the patients. There, there are very many procedures described in the literature. Among them, the substitution urethroplasty using either grafts or flaps is the standard treatment for long segment urethral stricture. So before we talk about the treatment options, we should be well aware of the blood supply of the corporal bodies, bodies and the urethra, and of course about the penile skin when we talk about the uh, penile skin flap. We all know that the urethra has got dual blood supply. The common penile artery after by dividing it enters it bifurcates as a dorsal artery of the penis, cavernosal artery, bulbar artery, and the urethral artery. The dorsal artery they they arborize in the glands penis and we get a retrograde blood supply to the urethra from the glands. So even when you divide the transit the urethra, urethra derives blood supply retrogradely from the, the, the dorsal artery which comes through the glands. So that is the advantage. Which, uh, which we can utilize when we do the urethroplasty procedure. The other thing is the, when you when you contemplate, when you plan to do any penile skin flap procedure, we should be well aware of the uh, penile skin blood supply. So the penile skin derives blood supply from the external pudendal artery, both the superficial and deep. At the base of the penis, the, the deep external pudendal artery is split into ventrolateral and dorsolateral branches. If you see in this picture, the, the uh, external pudendal artery divides into a branch which goes like this. This is the dorsal lateral branch, and this one which goes below is the ventral lateral. So these are all axial arteries. So when we plan your skin of canal skin flap, we should be aware of this ventral lateral and dorsal lateral flap, how they arborize, how they form the axial arteries, and how we develop a flap from them. So now coming to the uh, optional structure, so these are all the options available to us. If it is short segment structure, you can cut an anastrone. If the long segment structure, we need to, we, can, we can't sacrifice, we can't afford to sacrifice long segment of the urethra. So we have to substitute either by using the graft or flap. We can even do a, 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 a structure which is not too long or too short. We can do an augmentation of the anastomotic urethroplasty. I show you the slides and penile skin flap. And the newer one is the non transecting bulbar urethroplasty. And the good old procedure, what we have been doing during our training days is lay open the urethra, wait for three months, and then do a, a Johansson phase two tubular, which we are not doing nowadays. So now we talk of graft substitution urethroplasty. So which graft is better? We have got so many grafts. We can take a graft from the buccal mucosa, from the lingual mucosa, from the inner preposition skin, from the proximal penile skin. We can take graft from the bladder mucosa and into so these are all the grafts available to us. But among, among all these, the oral mucosa graft has to be test of time. Why? Because it is widely used and we have got good results. We have been using this graft for many years and the results are very good. 
And what are the, what are the advantages coming the, compared to the grafts which I have described earlier? It is readily available, easy to harvest from the oral cavity. The minimum the, the donor site morbidity is very minimal, and it is it is hairless and it presents a moist environment. The saliva is the moist environment. It has got a thick epithelium and thin vascular lamina process. So it has got so many advantages. So a few points I would like to highlight when you when you plan to do a oral mucosal graft harvesting. So it, the, the harvesting can be done under general anesthesia. Sometimes in our institute, we do under local anesthesia. When you do under general anesthesia, patient requires an esophageal intubation, and we need a, a, a retractor like this. They is called both gas. The tongue blade goes here and pulls the tongue. Uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the upper incisors which are retracted. So you get a nice uh, space like this when you do this. Uh, uh, David Gold Retractor, which commonly ENT suggests use for fluid transmission. Mark the graph. So be aware of the stencils that then explain in the graph. Graph harvesting. Graph bed. So earlier we were closing the glass bed. Now after it, we found that even if you don't close the glass bed, you can see your well. And then one advantage that you want to take the remove, you want to take the graph again, you can just leave the raw area and let it be. And once we take out the graft, we pad the graft, don't make it too thin and or too thick, just remove all the fat which is in there. And we can harvest graft up to six to seven centimeters from the foliage. So these are the points about graft harvest. So now having harvested the graft, so what are the different techniques? Where do we put the graft? Do you put it dorsally, do you put it ventrally, or do you put it on both sides? So these are the techniques we said: dorsal only, ventral only, asopa dorsal inlay. A double overlap, overlap. So the choice of the procedure depends upon the location no, of the stitches, length of the stitches, really? of fibrosis, previous treatments the patient has undergone, and of course, on the experience of the surgeon. So we'll talk about the only and ventral only. So, where do you use dorsal only? What are the pros and cons of the dorsal only? So the advantages of dorsal only are. If we have a good tunic of a corporate cavernosa, which acts as a pet for the graft situation, right? We can nicely take a quilting switch over the uh, corporate cavernosa. So there's a reduced risk of graft speculation when you put a dorsal only. And because you're doing a dorsal only, you're not disturbing the ventral blood supply of the uh, corpus fundi. So you're preserving the ventral blood supply uh, which comes from the corpus fundi. So those are the disadvantages of dorsal only on. It is difficult in proximal lumbar picture. So to go dorsally, to reach the proximal bulbar is difficult. So the anastomosis of the graft to the urethral mucosa in a proximal bulbar structure is difficult. So coming to ventral only, what are the advantages? You, you don't need to mobilize the urethra. Just give incision, do the inside the muscle, and you, you just open the urethra. Structure is easily visualized, and it's easy to see the graft. So what are the disadvantages? Because you are going through the vascular corpus conjugal, the blood loss is more. And that is the reason it is suitable only for the proximal bulbar stitches because the sponge then, then, and then it is difficult to do spongioplasty in a distance. Suppose you want to contemplate ventral only in a penile urethra, you can't do a proper spongioplasty. So that is the reason why we do uh, uh, ventral only for proximal bulbar stitch. So you can put it like this. So dorsal only is for penile stitches and mid and distal bulbar stitches, and ventral only is for proximal bulbar stitches. So this is the bulbous point in this muscle. So all the structures below this muscle can be operated by ventral only, and anything above this line, you have to do a dorsal. So before I talk about different techniques, I think we have to pay honor to these three great people who have totally revolutionized the management of structure dentistry. Dr. Asopa, Dr. Barbagli, and Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni. These are the pioneers, and the, the, the management of structure dentistry the last. Two decades has been totally like, revolutionized by these three. So they have made some modifications to the urethroplasty. What are the modifications? Dr. Asopa technique, we call it. Here we place the graft at the dorsal inlay, ventral sensual urethrotomy, followed by the dorsal sensual urethrotomy, and dorsal. I'll show this slides later on. And what did Barbagli do? Barbagli completely mobilized the urethra, lifted the urethra, and did a dorsal sensual urethrotomy and placed the graft at the dorsal organ. Later on, he modified the technique and he called it modified barbagli, where he mobilized the urethra to only to one side instead of completely lifting the urethra. He mobilized the urethra to one side and then opened the urethra dorsally, thus preserving the vascularity from the one other, other side. 
So Dr. Kilkarni added another step, not only present the vascular supply, he also did, he did not disturb the bulbous conjugate muscle. So it is called, uh, modified permanently can be called as a vessel sparing. The Kulkani technique can be called as a muscle sparing and a vessel sparing. So the other uh, the technique is parmentary technique where he has put the graft both dorsally and ventral. So now we'll come to the dorsal only erythroplasty. Now I'll show you some slides of how the Kulkani technique is done. So the procedure can be done under general structure or also at a spinal where we harvest the graft and the local anesthesia. The patient is put in a crucial lithotomy position. Now, always we do a erythroscopy with a uh, erythroscope to visualize the length and the uh, length of the stricture. And you can inject methylene blue because methylene, methylene blue sticks to the diseased mucosa. So when you open the urethra, you can nicely delineate the stricture segment. And the incision is midline perineal incision. You see here, this, this is the bulbous conjugate muscle. And these are the fibers which span, span over onto the, uh, the corporal catenosis. So they are called bulbo cannabis is part of the bulbous conjugate muscle. So you, you, when you do a muscle sparing technique, you just divide this muscle, don't, don't get inside this muscle. So when we divide this muscle, it just retracts. So we are not disturbing this part of the muscle. So this is the muscle sparing. So and then retract the muscle down and then imaginate the penis into the perineal wall. So you, by doing this, we can go up to proximal, even go the proximal urethra can be also approached and the graft can be placed as proximal as of the venom. So this is the muscle sparing. So once you uh, then we mobilize the urethra to one, take one side, that is uh, uh, the left side, the dissection is done. So the, the urethra is mobilized to the one side, the dark, completely dorsal surface of the urethra is seen and give a dorsal midline urethra. So here we have already injected the methylene blue. It has now, uh, the methylene blue is stuck to the diseased mucosa. We can easily identify the diseased segment. So these are dorsal sides of the protein. And then we suture the graph. When we suture the graph, the three, two most important points are proximally and distally, we take interrupted sutures. These three interrupted sutures are very important. So here we are taking proximal three interrupted sutures. The graft is fixed here. And the, the one side of the graft is sutured to the urethral mucosa. And then the other side of the graph is the substitution urethroplasty. So this is how the once you complete the urethroplasty, the puzzle is not disturbed, and the part which is uh, detached from the corporal cavity is being reattached there. And that, that this is called muscle sparing and vessel sparing. The ejaculation part is not disturbed. So the patient is not having any ejaculatory disturbances when you So these other patients where we can do a long segment structure also, put a graft uh, all the way from the to the uh, proximal. So now coming to the ventral only. So how do you do ventral only? Here, there's no other option. You have to incise the muscle, then incise the urethra in the midline. Again, you have to take three proximal sutures, interrupted sutures, fix the graft, then do a uh, fix the graft to the urethral edges. This is how the graft has been fixed. And then they do a proper spongioplasty. So I'll show a small video clip of uh, a ventral buckle because of that. Can I, can I, I think I don't know forward the video. So always do the erythroscopy. Uh, you can use the erythroscope. The six by seven French erythroscope, then pass a catheter and see till what level the, the catheter is going to put in. So, mark the, the catheter, or you can mark it on the skin and also on the urethra. Give it uh, incision in the midline perineal incision. Hey, forward this video. We are just going by the other way. So the now the bulbous spongiosus muscle is being incised. So again, you pass a catheter, identify the stricture site, then incise over the catheter because the disease implemented process extends. On either side, little one to two centimeters. So the graft has to go on to the healthy urethra. So we see here I'm extending my incision little above into the normal urethra. So inside, then deliver the catheter round. 
So the, now we can see the disease mucosa which is being stained by the methylene blue. Now the inside the urethra, ventral midline. This is the ventral sagittal urethrotomy. Till you go into the normal urethra, proximal urethra. You can take stain stitches which helps to nicely delineate the uh, urethral mucosa. They also help in reducing the bleeding. Then once we have entered into the uh, normal urethra, uh, of course, the high-protein anesthesia helps us to reduce the blood flow, the blood loss. And I already do erythroscopy even after the doing it, so it's confirmed. Now we measure the thinness path of the urethral bridge. Based on that, you can you can uh, decide about the width of your graft. Here, see, I am taking the graft at the local anesthesia. Most of our patients tolerate well at the local anesthesia. Suppose when you for a short second suture where you need only a single graft. It can be very well done at the local anesthesia. The graft is being harvested. Then it is de-padded. The finger support helps very well in de-padding the graft. Then the graft length is measured. Then we make some holes in the graft. Now this is the important part. We take three. This is the midline and suture at six o'clock. So three interrupted switches are taken. So now these three switches are fixed. Then we can do a uh, continuous running suture on one side and then on the other side. So the three switches are fixed. Then we start suturing the continuous suture the of the graph to the so, as I said, here we are going through the vascular sponge uh, user. Blood loss will be definitely more when we do a ventral organ. So, a point of uh, note is when you take this uh, urethral bite, you don't take through the full thickness of the sponge user. Half of the sponge user at the graft is taken because the rest of the sponge user helps us to do a sponge blast. So the bites are going to be only one half the spongiosum and the urethral mucosa. So full thickness of the carpal sponge is being done. So again, proximal distally, I am again I take three interrupted switches. So the graph is these are the interrupted switches. This is all a vessel only is done. So once this is done, then we need to do a spongioplasty. Uh, spongioplasty acts as a bed for the graft. So you can take two interrupted switches. So once this is done, we pass a catheter, a silicon protein fit silicon catheter. You can see that the nice bed for the Distal uh, interrupted which is taken. This is the uh, sponge. So when we, when we do a spongioplasty, we can take a little bit of the graft so that the graft will be fixed to the uh, spongiosum. There won't be any circulation. You can see I am taking a spongiosum and part of the graft, not the full thickness. So a little bit of the lamina property are taken to the graft and then the sponge. So that's that. So this is about the ventral organ. So next coming to the asopa procedure. What did asopa do? He did a ventral sagittotomy, dorsal hysterotomy, and dorsal inductor. So this is a patient who had a structure limited uh, resistance. So we did a uh, dorsal ventral hysterotomy and we made a wide dorsal sagittotomy uh, to accommodate the graft. So the graft is here as a dorsal inlay and then the urethrites. This is the asopa procedure. Is again, where the bed is adequate, make it. You can, you can, this uh, graph you can create even up to one and a half centimeters so that you can nicely place the graph of one, one, one and a half centimeters at the dorsal. So the next procedure is we, the, the structure lumen is very narrow. We can put two graphs one is a dorsal inlay, and the second one is a dorsal 
to on lane. So like this. So this is the dorsal inlay and this is the ventral one. So we had a patient who had a recurrent structure. The patient has already undergone uh, buccal mucosal graft, neuroplasty presented to us, and a very narrow retina. It's just at, you, he's on CIC, it will be 10 point fading tube with great difficulty. So it, it is a lead to urethroplasty. You can see a lot of fibrosis around the urethra. Urethra is open, and we needed dorsal against sensual urethrotomy, created a space to accommodate the graft. Then we had put a dorsal into the graft here, and we have put a ventral only. So this is a double overlapping graft. Dorsal inlet ventral. So the graft is placed and it is on to place. So, so next coming to the augmented elastomotic urethroplasty. This procedure is done when, when you feel that you cut the, the length of the suture is a little longer for doing an entry elastomotic. So in this procedure, the dense fibrotic section is required. The proximal and the distillates of the urethra are patronated till you reach the healthy urethra. So one end the dorsal or ventral edges you can approximate by doing anastomosis. On the other side, we can put a graft. This is the anastomosis. It looks like this. We can put a graft as a flow strip or as a rope strip. So which, uh, the graft can be placed ventrally or dorsally. The other side can be anastomosis. So we had a patient who has switched here. Though it looks a bit smaller, the disease because of our extending up to the current two centimeters on either side. So the interior system was extracted, the graft was taken, and the graft is placed dorsal section, and the ventral edges were anastomosis. You can see here. So the, the graft is placed dorsally, and these ventral edges go to anastomosis. So this is the object anastomotic flows to the urethral pass. So coming to the non transecting urethral pass. So when do you do non transective intraplasty when the stricture segment is short and not associated with the dense spongiofibrosis, where it is possible to excise the spongiofibrosis, leaving a bulk of the corpus spongiosum behind that the top and again we are da avoid damaging the bulbar arches. So this is how we do it. So in non transective intraplasty, open the urethra dorsally, we can excise the disease mucosa, whatever is there, and put a ventral inlay graft. So here we are putting the graft as a ventral inlay. This is a non-transecting urethroplast. So this is one of our patients with the, the short segment structure. You can see the urethroscopy findings. The urethra is opened over the graft. Here we did not put the graft, we just excise the structure and then anastomose the mucosal ends. These are the one, one way of doing a non-transecting urethroplast. So, so far we have described substitution using the graft. Now I'll tell you about a few slides about the substitution using the penile skin flap. So, penile skin flap is a versatile tool in the reconstruction of the anterior uh, structure. So, when do you do this? When we have an adequate non diseased skin and the arterial supply is dependable, and this flap can be used in a single stage or a two stage reconstruction. So mainly, you will have used it for pan reconstruction. So, when we talk of penile skin flap, we should be well aware of the vascular and the penile uh, facial anatomy of the penile skin. So, in the layers of the penile skin are dermis, subdermal plexus. Dorsal fascia, tunica dorsals, and the bus fascia. So this is important because when we take a flap, the flap has got blood supply from the tunica dorsal, and it has a the base of the bus fascia. So these two layers supply the flap, and this penile skin is supplied with the subdermal vascular. This is very important. So I will show you how the flap is made. So the well-developed penile skin flap has got a loose network of axial arches and means the tunica dorsal. Supported by a superficial layer of wax. So, all penile skin flaps are axial and island based. So, how do we classify penile skin flap? It could be a longitudinal flap or a transverse flap. It could be taken from the proximal penile skin or from the distal uh, penile skin or from the uh, uh, distal penile skin or peripheral skin. The pedicle can be derived from the dorsal or a ventral surface and you can make a tube or you can put it in the onlay. And we can do a combined tissue transfer. So that means we can put buccal graft on one side and penile skin flap on the other side. Combined tissue transfer. So, if, what are the precautions we take when we harvest the flap? The careful tissue handling is very important. We have to remain in the proper plane, otherwise, we may have tissue necrosis and epithelial skin flap. Use only a bipolar cartridge because we need a pinpoint coagulation. Magnification definitely helps us in getting in the proper plane. 
So we have to pre operating uh, when we do it, you know the length of the switches, and we have to uh, divide our clamp according to the length that is benefit from the system. Suppose if the native urethra is only 4 millimeters and we want to make a urethra which is 24 pence. So here we have to take a 20 millimeters wide skin plan. So the uh, width of the uh, what, uh, urethra is equal to the circumference of width of the urethra in millimeters is equal to circumference of the urethra in French. So if you want to make a 24 pence urethra, our urethra plate should be 20 millimeters, 24 millimeters. So these are the principal costs. So I showed you about some of the skin clamps. This is one of the patients who are home with a Morandi skin clamp. Morandi clamp is a longitudinal ventral canine skin clamp, which is got a later penalty. So this patient has got a canine suspension. We did a ventral and longitudinal incision and identified the urethra, opened the urethra laterally. So here the urethra is open. And then we mark the clamp here based on the length of the suspension. We measure the length of the suspension after opening and then divide it. Now mark the clamp. So when you do take a clamp, this incision, so the medial incision goes down up to the tunica, whereas the lateral incision only goes up to the tunica daughter because the blood supply of the clamp comes from here. So then you anastomose the one end of the skin clamp to the urethral mucosa, then they turn this urethra and push it to the urethra. This is the oriented skin clamp. So the lateral dissection is carried deep to the daughter's pressure. Until the clamp can be switched to the urethra in a tension field number. This is how the variety clamp is done. So, this is a patient uh, who did a variety clamp. I think uh, I will show you a little bit of You see, this is a nice clamp which is well taken up. And the problem is, if you pull a little uh, more proximal canine skin, you will take the skin which has got hair. So, that is the problem with it. Uh, so, you always should confine the clamp to the distal parallel, not the distal. So, another part is the thermal warming ventral parallel skin clamp. This is a hexagonal clamp. Completely, the, the skin clamp is based on the uh, ventral lateral branch of the extrapodental artery. It can be tunneled into the scrotum and it can be used as an overlay clamp for bulbar use. So, another uh, use of parallel skin clamp is for pan uniform stitches. We had a patient who had a long uh, stitcher, that's what I showed here, pan urethral stitcher. For this patient, we planted a few plants. How do we have the few plants? So we make a circumference stitcher along the penis. This width is depends upon the what, what size of the urethra you want to make. And if you want a longer length of this uh, clamp, you can make a few if, if it can go down like this. So this is how the skin clamp is divided. So this incision, the distal incision goes down right up to the tube calendaria. And the distal uh, proximal incision goes only up to the daughters. So, this is how the, the skin clamp is taken. This is the blood circle of the clamp. And we divide the clamp here ventrally. And that is so the proximal incision is dependent only up to the daughters. Uh, daughters' pressure is elevated to the skin. Subdermal plexus deep to the daughters supply the skin. And the dissection can is both. So, it is something like deep down the penis two times. So, you deep down here in one place. And the second plane, you deep down it here. So this is a few clamp. So once we divide it here, you open it, so you get a long clamp. Uh, initially, we have get, we got a clamp which is about 14 centimeters, and this is the blood supply of this uh, parent skin clamp. Again, it is thermal into the uh, perineum, the skin clamp is pushed and this is about the few clamp. And this is the urethroscopy of the same patient. Uh, this patient had a major stenosis. Uh, our self validation. So, this is the uh, Q clamp. I think for nearly a year after the procedure. And then take another clamp. So, now coming to the bulbar vessel loss. This is a very difficult uh, issue to manage. What are the options for the bulbar vessel loss? This can be done in two stages. It's called scrotal backdrop. Put the scrotal into the perineum. Then you can do it in two stages. You can take it bladder mucosal tube, bowel interposition. You can get the segment of the bowel with the between the mississippi into the middle and anastomose both ends of the bowel to the one end to the distal urethra and the other to the proximal urethra. And of course, we can do the preferential skin tube. So yet we had a one patient who had a complete bulbar vessel loss. He has been on SP, he was on SP for almost 15 years. He underwent urethroplasty at the age of 10 years. After that, 
The user doesn't pay and he was regularly sitting for nearly 15 minutes. So, it is very bad decision. It's a lot of calories for there. So, you can see this is a yantra. You can enter it. Transfer in the world became like a body thing. This is all the system is developed in the So, we had to access a lot of these calories. This is the proximal MD Yantra. You can see the mucosa here. So, again, in this patient, this is a transfer perfusion flap. This is the flap. The flap is tubularized. And the, it is brought into the perineum. The distal end of the flap, which is tubularized in an adjustment to the distal end of the flap, and the proximal end of the flap is an adjustment to the proximal end. So, after about 14 patients of penile skin flap, and two were already flap for penile stitches, and nine patients have read a Q flap. So one patient had a combination of buccal muscle graft and a Q flap. And two patients with bulbar retinas uh, required a perfusion tube. Uh, the tube length of the was about 11.5 centimeters to follow the uh, six patients. So all the patients, uh, both the patients with warranty flap was doing well. In Q flap, three patients developed erythropic in the uh, One patient with DXO, uh, which was only at the major. So we use the buccal movement to react to the meter, had a meter, you know, and the, both the patients with perfusion flap or bulbar lymphoma are doing well. So what does the literature say about the flap and graft? Which is better? Uh, in my experience, the graft is easy to do. Flap is you need a lot of expertise to do the flap. So this is a paper where they have compared buccal movement to graft versus penile to flap erythroplasty for long segment penile in the prescription. Here they have compared 42 patients with mucosal graft, buccal graft with 42 patients who had a penile skin flap. In this series, the success rate was higher with the buccal graft compared to penile skin flap. But there is another paper uh, where they have compared the same graft, buccal mucosal graft with penile skin flap. Uh, the author says that the buccal mucosal graft is technically easier, takes less operative time, and has potential advantages to reduce the post operative morbidity. And therefore, it is to satisfaction for more patients. So, in my experience, graft, the oral mucosal graft is the preferred substitute compared to the flap because it is easy for harvesting and easy for grafting. Easily reported, but you don't need a lot of expertise in doing graft. So, you know, when compared to the penile skin flap, it is reproducible. The results are comparable or even better than skin flap. So, flaps are used to indicate only in special situations. Uh, you need to have a non minute coerythra, non heavy skin in the prerequisite, and it needs a lot of technical expertise to harness the graft and reconstruct the urethra. And in my help, I found that the complications are more with the penile skin flap compared to the graft. So, now coming to how do you follow these patients after substitution in the past? There are two ways of following this. You can do a non invasive follow, which later on you can do an invasive follow. What are the non invasive ways to follow? We do a symptom score, a previous symptom score, urochromatory, post point of view, and even culture and subject sensitivity and examination. If you find that the flow is less or the patient's symptoms are increasing, we can do a gentle calibration in our OPD to see if there is any recurrence. And we can also do a retrograde event by which we have already fixed it in the future. And of course, the dispersive is both diagnostic and therapeutic. If you find any small narrowing, we can do a dilatation there and there. So initially, uh, we evaluate the patients with the non-invasive test and then select them to require for invasive test. So how do we define the success of erythroplasty? So these are the parameters. Patients should have at least the symptoms for the symptoms for the Asgard possible less than 10. Feedback should be at least more than 15. And uh, most important is patients with the test score. Uh, patient reported uh, parameters allowed are coming, and that is very one of the important parameters. Rather than our options are uh, and, and there should not be any UTI and it should be a program which will be near normal in the this project. That's the thing. So, how long do you follow these patients? Uh, we know we all know that when you do an estimate of plastic for a pelvic factor in the 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 book says that follow up at least for five years. After five years, the patient is doing well, you can stop following. But when we do a substitution in plastic, I have found that. The patient group have operated seven years back and eight years back or they're coming back with an error. I've seen patients who have used green well for 10 years and then he has come back with So the follow-up, they should be followed for at least 15 years 
कृपया भी ऐसे भी निश्चित फॉलो करो नहीं तो 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 कर लो सब्सटिट्यूशन यूज़ तो पास ही वी कैन यूज़ एकदम ग्राफ्स और ग्राफ तो आई थोड़ा सा ग्राफ्स और ऑलवेज इजी है तो बट ये बेटर भी तो चल रहा है और वन शुड बी फैमिलियर विथ ऑल द टेक्निक्स ऑफ सब्सटिट्यूशन यूज़ तो पास ही तो ऑफ कोर्स द चॉइस ऑफ द टेक्निक डिपेंड्स ऑन द स्ट्रक्चर कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स लोकेशन ऑफ द स्ट्रक्चर लेंथ ऑफ द स्ट्रक्चर द डिग्री ऑफ कॉल्ड फाइब्रोसिस एंड द प्रेजेंस ऑफ बी एक्स मोड प्रेजेंस ऑफ बी एक्स मोड इज कॉल्ड एंड इट्स वन रीडिंग स्किल का एंड प्रायर ट्रीटमेंट व्हाट प्रायर ट्रीटमेंट पेशेंट इज अंडर गॉन the most important is the expertise you have in which procedure you are good to keep them in the same procedure and of course the available procedure in the case there is no tissue available you have to go to the neurologist to use the graft if the buccal neurology is not good then you can use lingual mucus so when that is not available then you can go for or the fusion graft or something like that these are all the parameters you take into consideration when you do a substitution in this case thank you thank you very much Yes. One question. Yes, sir. 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 Very good results of flap with the plastic shown by Dr. Sudhir Prakash. So, the question for me by Dr. Nilan Thomas during TRP, if you find a very spastic external sphincter, uh, see, I don't know if your patient has spinal anesthesia given properly. Uh, there is no reason for you to have spastic external sphincter. Uh, some patients have a structure in proximal bulbar urethra and that sometimes you feel as if it is a spastic sinus sphincter but i don't think you should have a spastic sinus sphincter in trp and uh, i can't think of encountering this problem ever all of the, or every time you use stethoscope before you put your sheath in So when you use cystoscopy, you will see if the structure of it is a, or it is a, is what you are saying as spastic sternal sphincter. Maybe something else you are trying to put forth here. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, my name is Shalin. Just to conclude, uh, Shalin, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry, one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, डॉक्टर उटरी you do i and you evaluate them will be answer soft picture of course these pictures they don't with the stethoscope and dilatation but we don't know maybe, maybe the graft is shrinking and the, and the recurrent uti is causing some kind of fibrosis on the graft uh, these patients will be followed for really really long time when you put a graft or even for that the pattern flap for any substitution you will pass in these long term follow you feel that uh, they are getting good results It's not enough that you say that you follow them for two three years and say that I've got very good results. Over time, our success rate there's a lot of attrition in our success rate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our Nandalas, this was a really academic feast. Thank you so much.
Dr. Professor Dr. Dalila. I'm sure across India, people would have loved uh, this piece. And uh, the topic was really interesting, and uh, that's what the number of questions came across India. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, Dr. Suryavakas. Uh, what an uh, uh, academic content has been connected across India. Uh, many queries will connect you for the virtual. And uh, all the center participants, the doctors present across the world. Thank you so much for being part of this 11th session of Saturday School in Virology. Thank you so much, sir. All the centers, including Delhi, Jaipur, Rohtak, and Lucknow, Bangalore, Mysore, Cochin, Hyderabad, Vizag, Warangal, Mumbai, Pune, Jabalpur, Rajkot, and Nagpur. Also, would like to thank you, Calcutta, Patna, Guwahati, Bhuneshwar, Siliguri, and Durgapur. All the doctors, thank you so much for being part of this session. And also, would like to take this opportunity to thank you all the banquet and logistic partner to make this session much more academic and contentful. And our media partner, Ben Entry, who is there sincerely from the beginning to make the session much, much more academic one and content one and smooth one. Last but not the least, my complete sales team present across India who has made this happen. 22 centers, more, and more than 500 doctors connected this program and make this event full. Thank you so much, sir. Complete session is available on alchemurocare.com in the archive folder whenever any of your students or colleagues would like to connect it, please share with them. Thank you so much, sir. So far, good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Dalila, sir, and Dr. Surya Prakash, sir.